Welcome to NAC TV Reads the News. My name is Gwen Jacobson and I'm one of many volunteers that help create programming for our station. NAC TV can be seen on MTS channel 30 or 1030, Westman cable channel 17, Bell Satellite channel 592, or online at nactv.tv. These programs are made possible by our volunteers, staff, advertisers, as well as donations made by you, the viewers. If you are enjoying your NAC TV experience, please consider supporting us by either donation or volunteering. You can contact our office at 204-476-2639 or at nactv at wcgwave.ca. <coughs> This week's edition of the Nipah Banner and Press is dated Friday, November 24th, 2023. On the front page, we have a couple of pictures of something that's upcoming. Nipah has decided on the new school location. It is confirmed uh, by the Nipah Banner and Press. While most of Nipua already had a pretty good guess as to where our new vocational high school was to be located, any uncertainty to that answer was officially removed this week. In an email sent to divisional staff on Wednesday, November 22nd, Beautiful Plains School Division Superintendent Jason Young confirmed that an agreement has been reached for the purchase of 22 acres of land adjacent to the new regional hospital site. We wanted to inform our leadership group that we now have a signed contract with the landowners. So although we continue to work through various components like zoning, traf traffic studies, geotechnical surveys, land surveys, environmental studies, water drainage, etc., we now have an identified piece of land for our future build, stated Young in the email. The location of the new school has been a huge topic of discussion since it was first announced back in March. Many locals believed that land close to the new hospital site was the likeliest of locations for the facility. The Nipua project is one of nine new schools that were announced by the province back in March. It will be a grade 9 to 12 vocational school and child care center within the Beautiful Plains School Division. The plan right now is for the facility to be constructed and operational by September of 2027. So here we have, let's go like that. Uh, this is a recent picture taken of the ongoing construction of the Nipois New Health Center. That's this one right here. Now, in the near future, even more construction will be happening on Nipois East End as the new high school will be built just a little west of the hospital. So it's going to be in this area here. Hospital site, new school site. So that's going to be our fourth school in Nipois when that is completed. Wow. Exciting. Now, Hidden Hollow, Not So Hidden Anymore, by Ranzel Santos, an NECI work experience program. The Hidden Hollow store in downtown Nipua is, an in, is as interesting as its name implies, but it isn't hidden anymore as its popularity rises. In an interview with the Nipua Banner and Press, one of the owners of the store, Daryl Critchlow, seeing in this picture right here, <clears throat> who runs Hidden Hollow with his wife Belinda, was asked about how he got into business. Critchlow responded, my family has always had a business background. I've been constantly surrounded by and had a keen interest in it. Critchlow and his wife were the former owners of Chicken Corral, now called Chicken Chef. On a question about the transition from the restaurant to toy store, Critchlow answered, my wife Belinda and I took a year off from the restaurant. We wanted to add in different ideas for the Nipua community in the surrounding area, a kids store and more. 
would be a good change and nice addition to the community, we felt. For the upcoming Christmas holidays, Hidden Hollow has been stocking up on its supply of toys along with many other items. The outside of Hidden Hollow is very colourful and on a question about it, Critchlow said, We had it painted over the summer when the weather was being cooperative. The same ladies, Katie Martin and Megan Peters, who painted the inside of the store were also the ones who did it on the outside. They were very wonderful people to work with and did an amazing job. This is part of their painting on the inside. While this reporter was being shown around the store and its wide range of items, Critchlow's seemed passionate about the store and after being asked about it, Critchlow said, I definitely enjoy it here. In general, I love working around the public, even when I used to own the restaurant. Having interesting conversations and interactions with different individuals, children and their parents is something that I love. Hidden Hollow first opened on November 25th, 2022. For the upcoming anniversary of the store, Critchlow and his wife are currently planning to have a celebration filled with games, a prize draw, special deals and a toy drive for the Salvation Army. More information about this event can be seen at Hidden Hollow's Facebook page. Now, for some reason, there's a sports article here. Plainsmen fall to farmers. Carberry Plainsmen hosted the Nipua Farmers last Saturday with a 4-5 loss to Nipua. Kylan Aiken assisted by Zach Steen and Russell Adrianson in the second period for the first goal. Ethan Bjornsson, assisted by Jaden Johnson, provided the second goal of the second period, with Nipua leading with four goals. In the third period, Zane McConnell, assisted by Josh McMillan and Tom Monias and Brady Laycock, assisted for Josh McMillan, brought the score to four goals for Carberry. Carberry's next home game is November the 25th at 7.30 when we host Deloraine. There's an art another article later on in the paper uh, about this in the sports section. Now, the Santa Parade of Lights is going to be in Nipua this Saturday, November the 25th. Um, there's a free movie at the Roxy Theatre at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Santa will hand out can candy bags for the kids at the end of the movie. The movie is courtesy of Kinley Thompson Chartered Accountants. And then there's all there's a whole bunch of stuff going on during the day. Maybe it's somewhere else later in the paper. But there's also going to be a parade starting at 6 p.m. starting at the Yellowhead Center and ending at Buds and Bloom Daycare Center. All right. Out of Helen's Kitchen. This week it is about casseroles. The casserole is a one dish meal that the ultimate that's the ultimate comfort food to take the chill off a chilly day. Casserole is a French word meaning saucepan, which refers to the large deep dish used to cook in the oven and serve with the food cooked in it. The oldest recipe found for a casserole is from around 1250 and consisted of pasta cooked in water layered with grated cheese and spices. Some of the world's best known casseroles include the French cassoulet, British pot pies, Italian lasagna, Israel's kugel, Ukraine's cabbage rolls, and Greek moussaka. What's great about casserole recipes is that they can be adopted to adapted to your favorite ingredients or ingredients on hand. So if you have no cauliflower, use broccoli. If you hate broccoli, use carrots. You get the idea. We owe gratitude to Bessie Littleton for our Pyrex casserole dishes. In 1915, Bessie was frustrated with easy, breakable stoneware dishes. She asked her physicist husband if he had had anything better at his work at Corning Glass Work. He sawed the bottom of a battery jar 
made of a special shatter resistant glass and brought it home for Bessie to try. That was the beginning of the iconic Pyrex dishes, which became the staple casserole dish still used today. In the 1920s, new canned foods like tuna were all the rage, leading to the popular tuna casserole. In 1930, the Campbell Soup Company came to Canada and advertised its creamed soup varieties such as celery, chicken, mushroom, broccoli, and cheddar cheese. During the Depression, these soups made the casserole a simple and cheap way to use leftover food. The 1940s saw a lot of vegetable casseroles as meat was being rationed for the war effort. The 19... Reaching the height of popularity in the 1950s, every old 1950s cookbook I own has a very large section on casseroles. 1955, the Campbell Soup Company created the very popular green beans and mushroom soup casserole recipe. The 60s, the 1960s saw those many casserole dishes sitting next to the numerous unique jello salads and stuffed celery popular in the day. So Helen has three recipes. Uh, one is chicken divan, di, divan, divan, uh, chow mein noodle casserole and pork chop casserole. Oh boy, this brings back memories. My mother was the queen of casseroles. All right, Dan Mazier, We Must Continue Fight Against Carbon Tax Grab by Owen Devereaux. The spotlight on Canada's carbon tax plan has gotten a little brighter as of late as opposition to the environmental regulation continues to grow. In 2019, the Justin Trudeau-led government installed a $20 per tonne tax on all carbon dioxide emissions. It increased $65 per tonne this past April and moving ahead will rise by $15 per year until it reaches $170 per tonne. The average Canadian feels that impact in their home heating over the course of the winter and at the fuel pumps whenever they fill up their uh, vehicle. That additional cost is generating a negative response on a national level. A recent nano research survey commissioned by CTV News found that two thirds of all Canadians believe now is a bad time to increase the carbon tax. As well, the same survey showed that a majority of Canadians think the gas tax is ineffective at tackling climate change and reducing fuel consumption. On top of that, the Federal Commissioner of the Environment and Sustainable Development released a report earlier this month. It noted that even with the carbon tax in place, federal government will still fail in reaching its goal of reducing carbon emissions by at least 40% below 2005 levels by 2030. In a recent sit-down interview with Don Walmsley on NACTV, Dan Mazier, Member of Parliament for Dauphin Swan River Nipua, talked about all the talk around the gas tax as of late and the shift in support being seen across the nation. Mazier said the Conservative opposition did bring forward a motion recently in Parliament to analyze the tax policy. It was defeated by a coalition of votes from the Federal Liberal and the Bloc Québécois Despite the efforts to remain status quo, however, Mazier said this is an issue they're not going to give up on. He said, so our motion was defeated and we're not going to be able to look at it, but we're going to keep on pushing on it. We deserve to know what good does this carbon tax do? We've always said this is nothing more than a tax grab and it's costing us way more than we're getting back. <clears throat> Mazier also noted that they have brought up the option in question period of putting a hold on the carbon tax until the next election and letting Canadians decide how it proceeds. That suggestion was met with a non-answer from Trudeau. 
The seating of Canadian Parliament will return to Ottawa in late January. Now, there's a little article here about the Nipuan District Palliative Care Program. It's called Light Up This Holiday Season and Add a Warm Glow by ha helping out this important program we have in our community of Nipua. As you contribute, your, memora your memorial can be viewed in the window of Harris Pharmacy. The memory tree will be located at Mountain Avenue and Davidson Street, downtown Nipua. Contribute $5 in memory of a loved one. Drop off your contribution at one of these Nipua locations. Nipua Hospital, It's Time Fashion and Gifts, the Nipua Banner Press, Home Hardware, Nipua Pharmacy, and Harris Pharmacy. Now, we just read an article about Daryl and Belinda Critchlow, um, the store owners of Hidden Hollow. It says, meet Daryl and Belinda. So there's Daryl, there's Belinda. Supporting small business. What's the big idea is an initiative in the Nipua area coordinated by Nipua's Economic Development Office. Once again, Stride Credit Union was part, proud to be a part of this event, sponsoring the Best Overall Idea segment with a $1,000 prize for the winner. This year's winner was Hidden Hollow, a kid's store and more, located in Nipua. Belinda and Daryl Critchlow are the owners of Hidden Hollow and offer toys, games, books, candy and more as part of their retail space in the thriving community. As a bricks and mortar store within Nipua town limits, it is our vision to provide our area with what we see is a need in our community. We are super excited to continue to grow. The money is received from the Best Overall Idea Award will go towards extending our product offerings with plans to start on that in early 2024. Now we have two pages uh, from the Farmer's Advocate. Uh, the first article, Watersheds Have Grown in Number and Projects Since 1973 by Ken Waddell, Farmer's Advocate. Gary Wozolowski, Board Chair, Manitoba Association of Watersheds, recently reported in the MAW magazine the current fiscal year 2022-23 has been a record year for the Watershed District Program and I am inspired by the competency, commitment and adaptability districts have shown this past year. The scope and significance of the work being done across the province has been incredible. Funding delivery reached into the millions of dollars along with new projects, opportunities and partnerships. There have been changes and growth in leaps and bounds over a short period. This is an unprecedented level of programming being offered through the districts in addition to the ongoing quality projects and programs they already deliver. Wozolowski stated, I would like to recognize districts efforts and the high caliber of work they are doing in Manitoba communities in support of watershed health. I would also like to congratulate all district staff on an extremely successful year. Wozolowski said, as you read through the current, you will see the range of project, projects, educational events, community building, and some of the impact this work has on the health of our watersheds. What you read here is, of course, only a fraction of the work that happens in watershed district offices and out in these communities. The Watershed District program currently operates in more than 100 rural municipalities, towns, cities and villages across the province. It is the immense success of this program that has been the catalyst for the tremendous growth we have seen in 2022 and 23. In April 23, the Watershed District program expanded through enhanced core funding from the provincial government. Expansions occurred in Northeast Red, Pemina Valley and Red Boyne watershed districts. This means many new landowners will be able to access pro 
programs like the province's Growing Outcomes in Watersheds program. Wazalowski extended thanks to the province of Manitoba for their continued efforts to support watershed health and welcomed the new municipalities that have joined the watershed program. In September 2022, MAW launched the Prairie Watersheds Climate Program, known as PWCP, and the program was fully subscribed by March 2023. Through PWCP, new beneficial management practices have been implemented on more than 550,000 acres of land this past year in Manitoba alone, and more than 875,000 acres in Saskatchewan. MAW is thankful to the Government of Canada for helping watershed districts deliver several millions of dollars to landowners, working to create a lasting impact on water quality and climate change resiliency throughout both provinces. Most of southern Manitoba is covered by an organized watershed district. In the center of this map, is the White Mud Watershed District, right here, which was the first to be formed in Manitoba. It was established in 1972. Hmm. Farm Family Award nominations now open, also by Ken Waddell. The Provincial Exhibition of Manitoba, in partnership with BMO, is once again pleased to recognize the outstanding Provincial Farm Families with the 2024 BMO Farm Family Awards. This award has been a regular part of the Royal Manitoba Winter Fair for several years and were created to promote a renewed urban-rural relationship and to recognize outstanding Manitoba farm families who best exemplify the value of the farm family farm. This year's BMO Manitoba Farm Family Award recipients will be announced during the 2024 Royal Manitoba Winter Fair scheduled to run from March 25th to the 30th in Brandon's Keystone Centre. Nominations for the 2024 BMO Manitoba Farm Family Awards are now open and families can be nominated by friends, family or other members of the community by visiting www.provincialexhibition.com. Manitoba Farm Families contribute to both the, the province and their respective communities in many significant ways says Provincial Exhibition of Manitoba General Manager Mark Humphreys. We're honoured to have the opportunity to work with BMO in helping to recognise these outstanding members of our community. Farm equipment sales anticipated to slow in 2024, submitted by Farm Credit Canada. With higher interest rates, increased equipment prices and a decline in commodity prices, farm equipment sales are anticipated to slow going into 2024 according to Farm Credit Canada's 2024 outlook for the Canadian farm equipment market, also known as FCC Farm Credit Canada. But an aging equipment fleet could make the slowdown short-lived. The farm equipment market saw strong sales at the start of 2023 as inventory levels of new equipment rebounded and farmers recorded record high cash receipts. Canadian implement manufacturing dollar sales are also expected to finish higher in 2023 due to price inflation on raw material used in manufacturing. But with drought in Western Canada, and tighter revenues for the hog and dairy sectors in Eastern Canada, combined with high interest rates, producers are expected to be more cautious entering 2024. Farm revenue is a main driver in equipment sales, said J.P. Gervais, FCC's chief economist. 
He said record, record high crop receipts in 2022 and the first half of 23 put many Canadian farmers in a strong financial position to absorb the rising interest rates and equipment prices. We saw more cash purchases. This year, the drought in Western Canada has impacted overall production, reducing cash flow for some farmers. A slowing of equipment sales means new inventory levels will continue to increase, returning closer to pre-pandemic levels. In 2023, inventory of new equipment rebounded and is now in line with the five-year average for most categories. Air drills and 4WD tractors are some of the few equipment categories where sales growth is anticipated in 2024 as delivery issues and low inventory in prior years drive sales up. However, strong equipment sales between 2008 and 2014 and longer replacement cycles indicate that Canadian farm equipment fleets are starting to age. Producers will be weighing the efficiency uh, gains of newer equipment compared to the costs of repairing their current fleet, explained Gervais. This creates an opportunity for equipment dealers to sell new and used machines as well as sell parts and offer services to maintain older fleets. This is a trend to watch in 2024. By sharing agriculture economic knowledge and forecasts, FCC provides solid insights and expertise to help those in the business of agriculture and food achieve their goals. For more economic insights and analysis, visit FCC Economics at fcc.ca slash economics. And here is the sports page. First article, huge weekend for the Titans by Owen Devereaux. While the recent winning streak by the Nipua Titans is impressive enough, what's been even more impressive than that has been just how good the team has looked over the, that recent run. Coming off a solid 5-3 road win in Niverville, on Wednesday, November the 15th, Nipua earned itself a pair of victories at home on the weekend. First, they picked up a 6-0 victory over the Selkirk Steelers on Friday, November 17th. The Titans followed that up the next night with a 6-3 decision over the Niverville Nighthawks. While the wins themselves are reason enough to celebrate, fans of the Titans should be even happier with the way the team has won, as performance-wise, the players were near perfect. Every pass was tape to tape, every shift was high tempo, and every little battle that takes place out there on the ice over the course of a game was won by the boys in the black and gold. The Friday night win over Selkirk featured a pair of goals from recent arrival from the Estevan Bruins' Tim Taconic. The left winger, based out of Calgary, would add a goal and, a, and an assist on Saturday night. After a bit of a slow start in Nipua with just three points in his first seven games, Tyconic has really come on as of late with eight points, four goals and four assists in his last four games. Another new contributor is a familiar name to Nipua, Hayden Stocks. Since returning to the Titans from the NAHL, the 20-year-old has been on a tear with six goals in his first six games. That included three goals over the weekend. After Saturday's win over Niverville, Titans head coach and general manager Ken Pearson said that Stocks, Tyconic, and the rest of the players are stepping up to the challenge. He puts a big part of that to the leadership in the locker room. After the Dauphin game, team captain Cody Gwinnison came to me and we had a little chat. He and the guys got together and talked about what needed to be done and they've come into practice all week and put in the work and dedicated themselves to ensuring all the little things that need to get done to win are getting done, said Pearson. As well, the new players that we've added to our roster the last month are and are to finding that rhythm on the ice. That's allowing everyone now to find opportunity out there. And it goes on to say, <clears throat> The 
the Manitoba Junior Hockey League, the MJHL, has announced its original 16 stars of the week for November 13th to 19th. This week's lineup includes an important member of the Nipah Titans as Cody Gwinnison has been singled out for recognition. The veteran forward from Killarney has played a key role in the Titans' three-game win streak last week. In a 5-3 road win over the Nighthawks, Gwinnison scored a goal and added three assists in his first four-point outing of the season. He added a lone assist in their 6-0 win over the Steelers before he added another assist and scored the game winner on home ice in the rematch against the Nighthawks. The Titans are now just one point back of the fourth and final playoff spot in the MGEU West Division. The other stars of the week include forwards Slade Stanick of the Portage Terriers and Jace Lagarden from the Winkler Flyers. Okay, I think it meant this article here that was uh, along with what I was talking about with the, the coach talking. Coach Pearson also commended defenseman Brendan Quinn Lagria and Jace Larkins for their efforts since arriving in Nipah via trades. Even the goaltending combo of Mason Lebro and Casey Cookett are finding their stride, each registering a win over the weekend, with Cookett's being a 24 save shutout. Team captain Cody Gwinnison, who had three points, one goal and two assists over the weekend, told the Banner and Press that everyone just took the time to evaluate where they were at after the November 11th loss to the Dauphin Kings. We really looked back at our game on that day against Dauphin and we knew we battled hard but that we were capable of more. We took that into practice all week and it's paid off with some results out there in our last few games, noted Gwinnison. Next up for Nipah after a mid-week game in Niverville, which um, I read last night that Nipah did lose that game in Niverville 3-2, to two, another close game. They have a pair of weekend games coming up. First, they'll host the Winnipeg Blues on Saturday, November 25th, and they'll follow that up with a game on Sunday, November 26th in Portage against the Portage Terriers. So I might as well read this sports article too. It's, in, it's uh, entitled Instructor on the Ice. Land, this is a picture of Landon Cameron, who is the assistant coach for the Nipah Titans Junior A hockey team. But he also is the head instructor for the team's junior hockey program. So this is an article by Ranzel Santos. At the new Nipah Titans Junior Hockey Camp, head instructor Landon Cameron expressed his enjoyment for the sport and for teaching hockey. He said, I started this program for the first time today. Unfortunately, it was postponed a few times, but I'm glad we could get it started now. In terms of coaching, I have been doing this for the past 13 years in Nipah, helping out when I can, in response to being asked how long he has been doing this type of program. As Landon Cameron puts it, it's really just a skills camp for anyone in minor hockey. It's a place for kids to play and learn the sport as well as keep active and be outside. On the topic of what got him interested in hockey and coaching, Cameron says, I love hockey, I love the sport, and I enjoy helping out and coaching kids. From there, it was just an easy progression, teaching hockey, giving back to the community however I'm able to. After being asked if he enjoys his work at the hockey camp, Cameron stated, I absolutely love it. Hockey is one of my favorite things to do. Combined with how much I enjoy coaching, it works out. <laughs> All right, Nipua, <coughs> Nipua Farmers hockey team wins in Carberry by Owen Devereaux. A three-point night, three night from Benoit Mowbray 
paired with an eventual game-winning goal from Brett Lewandowski, helped the Nipah Farmers to hold on to a 5-4 win over the Carberry Plainsmen. Mowbray scored twice in the second period and assisted on the first Farmers score, a goal from Connor Gork. Lewandowski also contributed a multi-point effort in Nipah's win with three assists to go with his third period power play marker. Ward Brister scored the other goal for the Farmers. As for Carberry, Kylan Aiken and Ethan Bjornsson each scored in the second. Zane McConnell and Brady Laycock would contribute goals as well for the Plainsmen late in the third period to make the ending a bit more dramatic. At the end of regulation, however, Nipua was able to hold on for a 5-4 victory. Farmers goaltender Gatlin Platt stopped 25 shots to pick up the win, while Carberry's Connor Slip dealt with a 50-shot barrage from Nipua on the night. This result improved Nipua's record to 3-2-0 on the year, while Carberry fell to 2-4-0. As for Minnedosa, <clears throat> the Minnedosa Bombers put together a big weekend on the road, winning games in McGregor and Gladstone. <coughs> the first of those two was a 5-1 win for the Bombers in McGregor on Friday, November 17th. Minnedosa scored the first four goals of the game, including Shane Jury picking up a natural hat trick, Patrick Condrato and Matt Saylor also added singles to the stat sheet for the Bombers. As well, Saylor had three assists to go along with his goal. It would be more on the same the very next night in Gladstone as the Bombers blanked the Lakers 5-0. It was another multiple goal game for Jury, though it was only two goals this time out. <laughs> Cole Erickson, Bryson Werbicki Mallet, and John Cowell also contributed with goals, with Jason Argue earning the win with 31 saves in net. These pair of wins pushed Minnedosa into second place in the Tiger Hills Hockey League's East Division with a 4-2-0 record, but very close. Now, in this week's edition of the Nipah Banner and Press, there is a one full page uh, of the online auction that the Nipah Rotary Club is going to be holding December the 1st to the 7th, 2023, of course. Uh, it is a major fundraiser for them. So it has, uh, so far, about 153 items along yeah and uh, they have had some cash donors uh, so for information updates and to see how to register and bid visit the website at nipawa rotary dot weebly dot coms weebly is spelled w-e-e-b-l-y so nipawa rotary dot weebly dot com and proceeds are going towards community projects to view items online and to register to bid on items go to nipua.charity-auctions.ca the bidding starts at 8 a.m on friday december the first <coughs> Carberry Chamber Trade Show provides networking opportunities by Jolene Bel Belsiunas. <coughs> the Carberry Chamber offered a trade show for the first time highlighting the businesses, trades and opportunities that are available in Carberry. Grade 10, 11 and 12 students from Carberry Collegiate were invited to participate in the afternoon then the doors were open for free to the public. This was a fantastic opportunity to showcase our community and what is available here, assisting our youth in developing their path to success right here in their home community. 
also giving businesses and organizations the opportunity to network and strengthen the business community. Carberry Chamber of Commerce has been busy with preparing for Christmas with their Flip the Switch on November the 15th. Several businesses have decorated and begun the holiday festivities. Main Street Carberry has had several new additions and changes in the last few years. The Carberry Town Office now has a completed facade with recycled bricks from the old bank offering a beautiful upgrade to our heritage Main Street. And this is just a few pictures of uh, the Carberry Chamber of Commerce trade show. That's a great idea. All right, so I'll go back to a, pay, a couple of pages I haven't gotten to. <clears throat> Home Bodies by Rita Friesen. It's called Bits of Self-Revelation. It starts, no surprise here, I am an introvert, self-reflecting and self-examining. I am also a storyteller. Makes for an interesting combination. This week I had opportunity to laugh at myself more than once. One of my policies is to shop at home as much as possible. I appreciate that should any of my purchases need attention, my needs are heard and appreciated. The other morning, as I mentioned, I awoke, I awoke to the sound of my washing machine spinning or trying to pump water out of an empty tub. My initial response was to unplug the machine. In the morning, I tried repeatedly plugging it in, letting it spin, and then stopping it only to try again in a bit. One of my stops that morning included a visit to Orv's Appliances. I explained my dilemma admitting that I had done a load of laundry the night before and had not unloaded the machine. With a smile and a gentle tone, the owner suggested that perhaps I was not a very patient person. If I had allowed the machine to spin for less than 15 minutes, it would have completed its own reset. The suggestion was that I turn the washing machine on, take the dog for a good walk, and if all was not well when I returned, the service repair person would be right over. Imagine my relief when on re-entering my home, the machine was quiet, ready to go. Rather than the time I scour scoured my laundry room anticipating that the dryer would need repair, only to have the owner of local appliance sales ask a few pertinent questions and send me home with a new knob for the dial. No service call required just good humor and helpful advice. When my friend was out from the west coast, we had a fire in the fire pit. I had encouraged her to don a pair of white hunting overalls from the closet, very like the pair we had given her when she helped clean sheds out at the Riding Mountain acreage. The smoky overalls hung in the garage until she was ready to pack up and leave. As she bundled them into her luggage, I asked if they were the ones from the closet. Nope, they were the ones she had brought from home. You sure? Absolutely, with anticipation of an open fire, she had come prepared. Truthfully, we never do plan our excursions or adventures. They simply happen. But I do know how very much we both enjoy a fire. <clears throat> no problem. There was still my set of coveralls hanging, and that's all I really need. They were a gift from her a decade ago, with St. Rita embroidered on the, pro on the pocket. This week, there was a notice for a package at the post office. Now, I recognized the script and the address, but I often receive books from my friend, and so thought little about the box, except that it was light. Enclosed was the pair of white coveralls with a howling note of apology, including tripe and balderdash. And you were very and only gracious, and I still have much to learn from you. All right. Um, there's a little cartoon at the top, Tundra by Chad Carpenter. Looks like two spiders talking. 
I've never been, this one is saying, I've never been uh, very good at spinning webs. Crocheting, however, <laughs> looks like a doily crocheted and his web. <laughs> All right, right in the center by Ken Waddell. This week his article is, enti <coughs> is entitled Repair or Replace? That is the question. <coughs> Following is a redo on a column I put out around this time last year when I was asked a pointed question by a person who lives in the region and knows about Nipua but doesn't live in the town. The question was, Nipua is a progressive town, isn't it? I paused with my answer and then offered, yes, it is a progressive town, but sometimes reluctantly. <clears throat> I based that answer on over 50 years of living in Nipua and the area. For many decades, Nipua's population was fairly static, around 3,000 people. In the last 10 years, it is ramped up to nearly 6,000 and now ranks as the 11th largest town in Manitoba. The growth is the envy of many centres. So why did I say reluctantly? Well, it's because that is what I have observed. Growth has been accepted, but I contend it hasn't always been sought out. Nipua's approach seems more passive than in centres like Morden, Winkler, Steinbach or Niverville. <clears throat> the latter, Niverville, now ranks slightly ahead of Nipua in terms of population. Winkler established a growth plan many years ago and the town leaders have obviously followed the plan. Numerous investors have come to Nipua and often noted that there is no real plan in place. That has changed, but it could be argued there is a lot of progress left to be achieved. Times have changed, and for Nipua, the Spring Hill hog plant, built in the late 1980s, was the spark that set the growth ablaze. Spring Hill was, by today's standards, a modest proposal that grew very slowly until it was sold to High Tech, which became High Life. Now it employs 1,700 people or more and has seen a huge influx of immigrants to Nipua. High Life didn't grow without a plan by both the company and the town. Investments in housing and infrastructure have been in the hundreds of millions. The company has been very focused and strategic and in the past few years the town has been more focused than in the past. All that said, more strategic planning and infrastructure is needed. The new hospital has been announced. The new fire hall is up and functioning. The new police station just opened. The new school is full and then some. <clears throat> and a new school is going to be starting soon. As for housing, there are about 200 new housing units, homes and apartments currently under construction. Nipua is definitely growing. Much of the growth has come largely from outside investment and influence. High Life has been almost all outside investment, while the town, province and feds have invested heavily in infrastructure. <coughs> while growth has been pretty good in Nipua, this observer of 50 plus years sees some major differences between now and 30 to 40 years ago. The big difference is that the past local business decision makers were more plentiful. Nipua always had five or six machinery dealers and they used to be all locally owned. Now only one is locally owned. Car dealerships tend to be largely influenced by out-of-town ownership groups. Perhaps the biggest difference is banking decision makers. Only the credit union makes the larger business decisions locally. All the banks used to do so. Back in the day, farms and businesses could talk to the decision maker locally. Some names that come to mind are Des George at BMO, Jerry Houston at RBC, and Gord Sylvester at CIBC. It appears the bigger farm and businesses lending decisions are made out of town. Perhaps growth might be faster and more efficient if we had more locals in the bigger businesses ownership chairs and in the banking management chairs. 
Another area that Nipua appears to be lagging is in long-term planning for recreation. Nipua is somewhat unique in that the arena, the community hall, the curling rink, and the golf course are all owned and operated by local committees. The town of Nipua puts minimal dollars into those four facilities compared to other towns. To put it bluntly, the town of Nipua and the taxpayers have gotten off pretty cheaply compared to other locations. That all said, it has worked, but the day is coming and may be well past where major repairs or even replacement will be re-needed be needed. As far as I know, neither the town nor the respective committees have a fund or a plan for upgrades or replacement. The Yellowhead Arena is 50 years old. The golf course club room is very old and while it works, members long for an upgrade. The curling rink is old also, but needs upgrades as well. The, the Yellowhead Center hall portion was built in the 1940s as a warehouse for the former salt company. To replace all the buildings listed would likely be in excess of $40 million. That's a lot of money, so perhaps the committees and the town had better sit down and make a plan. In my view, improvements might better be achieved by upgrades instead of replacement. <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I guess I should read the Gladstone Cattle Market Report by Tyler Slowinski. Temperatures are sinking rather than hooves in the pen as the ground firms up. Orders that normally would have started have been patiently waiting for better conditions before stocking pens of cattle for the feeding season. Between these orders and the idea of purchasing grass cattle earlier than usual with the thought of a feeder cattle shortage when the proper times comes, time comes has parts of the feeder market perking up. We traded 1,635 cattle through the ring in Gladstone on November the 21st. The market this week was still under pressure in certain spots. The futures haven't been very stable. The outlook looks much better further out, which gives the lighter cattle more strength on the market. Believe it or not, we are still seeing a fair amount of volume pressure across the prairies. Some of the peak prices we have seen over the weeks may have softened somewhat, but the overall averages are still very strong, if not stronger in spots. The market is seeing a majority of wet-nosed calves and still a few cows and bulls as preg checking practices start to ramp up for the season. Finding pen space, financing at new levels, or coordinating trucks will all be playing factors on the market moving into the weeks ahead. As there seems to be a good feed supply in some areas of the province, local orders have really added strength to this week's market. I expect to see mixed feelings on the markets moving forward, creating ups and downs in the market. Cows and bulls saw a major correction over the past couple of weeks. Cows traded fully steady from 115 to 125 with higher averages. Bulls also steady ranging between 140 to 146.50. The cattle marketing outlook looks both promising and very busy in the weeks to come. All week, all classes of cattle sold well. Plainer type cattle are still being discounted. Here is a look at the feeder market. Some highlights from the sale, cross bred steers weighed 417 and they brought 446 per pound. Cha uh, sorry, Char steers weighed 535. They brought 406. Red X steers weighed 629 and they brought 377.25. A strong set of mixed steers weighed 716 and they traded for 348. Heifer highlights 
black heifers weighed 453 and they brought 377. Fancy 538 weight char heifers traded at 337. A set of crossbred heifers weighed 625 and they brought 327. And a big set of 756 weight mixed heifers traded for 290.50. All right, Faithfully Yours by Neil Strohshine. This week, his article is entitled, The Unknown Way. It is one of the Bible's most sobering statements. It first appears in Isaiah 59. It is repeated in Romans 1. It applies equally to all people in all periods of human time. In eight words, it summarizes our human condition. The way of peace they have not known. From the day Cain, the eldest son of Adam and Eve, in a fit of jealous rage killed his brother Abel, humans have yielded to the urge to use domination, intimidation, and violence to get what they want by imposing their will on others. This attitude has led to countless interpersonal conflicts in a series of local, regional, and world wars. History has shown that we are very good at talking about peace, but that we do not know how to secure a lasting peace for ourselves and our world. We've had lots of ideas. We've had so-called experts in human relations tell us how we can learn to get along with each other. We've had politicians of all political parties tell us we should be more loving, accepting, and tolerant than we are. But much of what these experts and politicians say falls on deaf ears. That should come as no surprise. If our first parents couldn't keep peace in a world with a total population of four, what makes our current social scientists, governments, and international bodies like the United Nations think they can do any better? There will never be peace in our world until we deal with the inner conflict that causes war. For that, there is only one solution. To find it, we must go back to the beginning of time, to the event that caused Cain's anger and led to the murder of his brother. His story can be found in Genesis 4. <clears throat> Cain's anger, as we see in Genesis 4, 5, had nothing to do with his brother Abel. It had everything to do with Cain's relationship with God. Both men knew about God. They both understood God's standards of right and wrong. They both knew that they, that when they violated those standards, they had to offer an animal sacrifice to atone for their sins. But the similarity ended there. Abel met God's demands for a suitable offering. Cain did not. When God rejected Cain's offering, Cain got mad at God. Had he come back with a suitable offering, God would have forgiven him and Cain would have found peace with God and others. But he didn't. He killed his brother and as punishment for his crime spent the rest of his life living in exile. What was wrong with Cain? The same thing that's wrong with me, with you, and with every person on earth. We have allowed sinful selfish pride to make a god out of our ego self. We have chosen to go our own way, do our own thing, satisfy our own cravings and exalt ourselves above all others around us. All forms of prejudice, racism, corruption, and criminal cover-ups are committed by people who are in bondage to pride, believe that they can act like gods and are not convinced that no one, not even God himself, can stop them. The God of heaven offers us an alternative four words found in James 4. Submit yourself to God. The way of peace begins when we recognize God's right as our creator to govern our lives, submit to his authority and obey his commandments. All other paths lead to more conflict and war. God's way is the only way to peace. Now we have a picture here. It's hard to believe that is the old RCMP building in Nipua. It has been totally renovated to be the future home for ACC Practical Nurses Training Program. 
the renovations are complete. Here we have a picture of the mayor and council as well as administration for the town of Nipois recently toured the completed renovation and expansion of the former RCMP building. The space, which has been expanded by about 700 square feet, will house the new Assiniboine Community College Practical Nurses Training Practical Nursing Diploma Program planned to begin in January of 2024. Looks great. All right, well, the only thing I have left to read is looking back, which is always kind of interesting because it goes back so many years. By Casper Warehan. 125 years ago, November the 19th, 1898, <clears throat> These were the articles in the Nipah Banner and Press. Gordon M. Matthews, son of the pioneers of this district, died at the residence of R. Dunsmore, where he has made his home for some years past since becoming an invalid on Thursday morning last. The remains were interred in Nipah Cemetery yesterday. A large number of old settlers attending the funeral, showing their respect for the one who bore his full share in the battles of life. <laughs> one of the largest choppers in the country has been added to the mill plant here. It has six rollers and is capable of chopping 200 bushels per hour, turning out its product almost as fine as flour. <laughs> 100 years ago, November the 20th, 1923, the large number of repairs this past year to waterworks connections indicates inferior materials and workmanship when the installation was made 10 years ago. This is aggravating, but how about the repairs? Is better material being used by more dependable workmen? If not, why not? If we do not learn by costly experience to do better, our future is hopeless. <laughs> 75 years ago, November 25th, 1948, full production started again at the Nipua Salt Plant of the Canadian Industries Limited. Saturday, after the local work had been practically shut down since Saturday midnight, November 13th, when the company were unable to get deliveries of coal from the strike-bound Estevan area. Coal deliveries are being received and all the workers are now back on the jobs in the Nipua salt industry. William Jacks, who recently retired from the CNR, was the recipient of a lovely travel bag at a party held in the Bernie Community Hall Monday night. Bill Jacks is a veteran of the First World War and a Mason and has served the CNR as a section man for many years. Installation of the 60,000 power line poles required to service the 5,000 farms which are to be provided with electricity under the provincial government's rural electrification program for 1948 is now practically completed according to the monthly report issued by W.D. Fallis. General Manager of the Manitoba Power Commission. 50 years ago, in uh, November 22nd, 1973, 12 Nipua dog owners appeared before Justice of the Peace George Bates on Tuesday of this week and pleaded guilty to harboring a dog without a license. They each paid fines of $5 and costs. Viola Radford lives in a big white house on the edge of the town of Keys. It was once a thriving, busy little town, but it is not anymore. The elevator has gone, the school has gone, the church has gone, the store has gone. Little remains to remind people of its past prosperity. Shopping is usually done in Gladstone or wherever one happens to be if there is a store handy. <laughs> Viola Radford was born in Minnedosa <clears throat> in 1893. Her father was a brakeman on the railroad. 
The day she was three months old, her father was killed in an accident. He was just 24 years of age. There was no mother's allowance, no welfare or aid of any kind for those who were stricken in circumstances. Her mother bundled her infant daughter up and went to work for a Mr. Matthews, a farmer at Glendale. It was there that Viola spent her early days. And a note to go with this. This entry is a portion of the 79th Pioneer of the Beautiful Plains feature written by Len Wenham on Viola Fawcett Radford. The full story is too long to share, but Viola Radford would come to live near Keys in about 1935. Now the last article, 20 years ago, 2003, Gladstone's Northwest Handy Transit Inc. has received a $15,000 grant for the purchase of a new handy van. But a board member says the organization, while grateful for the funding, won't back down on its fight for funding equity between rural and urban handy transit services. And then lastly, there's just this picture from looking back. Reverend and Mrs. Uh, Sear, George Sears, pastor of the First Baptist Church in Nipua, were presented with the gift from the Nipuan District Ministerial Association by Captain Merle Woodley of uh, the Salvation Army on November 14, 1973. A farewell lunch has been held in the Rose Room of the Bamboo that day as Reverend Sears has accepted a pastorate in Oakview, Baptist Church in Winnipeg. All right, I think that's about it for this week's edition of the Nipah Banner and Press. So thank you for joining, joining us here at the Nipah Banner and Press, and hopefully we'll see you another day. So bye for now.